Well, hello, friends. Hi, I am Bishop Jerry Hayes. I am Abbot General of the Apostolic Disciples of the Way. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Disciples of the Way. And today we're going to be talking about a churchman uh, of the early to mid fifth century by the name of Nestorius. And we're going to be talking a little bit about the, the Nestorian controversy and the Nestorian heresy, so called. So you want to stay tuned. But before that we do that, let me make this uh, bit of uh, announcement. Right down below there in our information box uh, is our all of our information, our uh, email, and also our giving information. I would ask you to please pay close attention to that. Also, go there and like this uh, episode and share it with your friends and those who are interested in church history. And also, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, be sure to do that. I want to make mention of the Company of the 100 before we get started the Company of the 100 are supporters that have come along beside us to stand with us with their daily prayer support and prayer covering of this ministry and for this ministry, and also with a reoccurring financial gift each month. And I would like for you to pray to, about becoming a member of the Company of the 100. There are a lot of perks and benefits that uh, you get for becoming a, a member of the Company of the 100. First, you would receive uh, as a free gift, postage paid, my signature book, Godhead Theology, which is over 600 pages. Also, you would get a monthly mailing of our e-magazine called Orthodoxy and uh, any white papers or research papers that I have written during that month. Plus, you have the availability of my entire bookshelf for one half price of the publisher's cost. So uh, I would like for you to pray about this. Now, before we get to our lesson today, Let's go to the Lord, our God, in prayer. Shall we do that? Most gracious Heavenly Father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness today, and on our minds that we might perceive truth, and on our hearts that we might believe truth, and on our lips that we might speak truth with clarity and conviction. These things we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom is the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us, one God, world without end. Amen and amen. Now let us go right to our uh, presentation today. And we're going to be talking about Nestorius. Now, uh, we're going to pick up Nestorius's life uh, in along about uh, 427, 428. This is when Nestorius was elevated and consecrated to be the bishop at Constantinople. Now, Nestorius was from Antioch, Syria, and he had a monastery there, but he was the uh, primary preacher in the cathedral church in uh, Antioch, and he was very popular. He was one that was sought after for his uh, sermonizing ability. He was a theologian of quite some renown. Stenographers are people who took shorthand, would take down all of his sermons in shorthand, then they would be uh, copied into longhand, and then several copies would be hand, hand uh, copied, and then his sermons would be sent throughout 
the Roman Empire to all of Christendom at that time. And not only the Roman Empire, but uh, into the east where the Roman Empire had no jurisdiction, into Persia, uh, what is now Iraq and Iran, and even as far as India and even into China, what is now China. Nestorius was a very influential monk. The, uh, what should I say, the pulpit in Constantinople became vacated and the emperor was looking for someone to fill that seat or that seat. And there was much ha uh, haggling and, and, and much debate over what person should be the patriarch of Constantinople. We're going to be dealing in this story with four major patriarchates, Constantinople, Rome, Antioch, and Alexandria. And Jerusalem is here also, but Jerusalem plays a subservient role to the other patriarchates. However, when Nestorius was chosen, finally, uh, to go to Constantinople and become the bishop there, then there is no other way that I can say it other than this, all hell broke loose. You say, Bishop Hayes, you shouldn't really talk that way, standing in the altar area of your cathedral. But I don't mean it in a crass way. I mean it in a very literal way that the demons of hell rose up on their hind legs and howled and brought havoc into the, ch into the church and uh, that is even felt to this very day. Now we're going to get into the ministry of Nestorius after he went to Constantinople. But before we do that, let me say this, that Nestorius is celebrated as a saint and he's venerated by the Assyrian Church of the East, the Chaldean Syrian Church, and the ancient Church of the East. Now, if you'll notice that the churches that I've mentioned that Nestorius is venerated as a saint in are not Western churches, they are Eastern churches. Churches that did not come under the influence of uh, the Roman Empire and the emperors of Rome. Consequently then, the church of Rome and the church of Constantinople and the church of Alexandria, Egypt, does not recognize him as a saint. In fact, they recognize him as a heretic. So how is it that such a large part of what is called Christianity views Nestorius as a heretic but yet the entirety of the Church of the East recognizes Nestorius as a saint, venerates him, along with Theodor, uh, Theodora of Matsuestia, and also along with uh, Diodorus of Tarsus. Their day, or their feast day in the Eastern calendar is October the 25th. Now, let's get back to Nestorius. He was born probably in the year of 368 uh, in the area of what is now Turkey called uh, Germanicaia. And uh, he was a very popular preacher and he was taken from Antioch to Constantinople to be the patriarch of uh, the see of Constantinople. Now there was another, as a matter of fact, there were uh, three other personalities that were patriarchs of their own see that we're gonna be talking about in this episode. First, there is Cyril of Alexandria, Egypt. And then there was Calistine, some say Celestine, of Rome, and there was John of Antioch. 
And the players in this drama also includes Theodotus II, uh, the emperor of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, there in Constantinople. Oh, and there is another player here that I want to mention. Matter of fact, two others. One is Eusebius of Constantinople, not to be confused with Eusebius of Caesarea, the church historian, but Eusebius of Constantinople and also Memnon, who was the bishop of Ephesus. So now we're going to get right into our story. And I hope that you can appreciate the intrigue that you are about to hear. When Nestorius arrived at Constantinople, he brought with him an entourage from Antioch of not only presbyters, but also other bishops for his staff and for his uh, ministering needs there as the patriarch. Now, when they arrived at Constantinople, they found the capital, Constantinople, all in a buzz concerning the word Theotokos. Theotokos was the Greek word that the monks and the laity were using to reference Mary. And Theotokos translates literally mother of God. Well, Nestorius came from Antioch, which had a very high form of Christology. And uh, in Antioch's uh, Christological paradigm, Christ was seen as uh, having two natures, the Logos of God being God, because John 1 and 1 says the God was the Logos or God was the Word, and also of being man. So in the Antiochian uh, Christology, the hypostatic union was that, that Christ was uh, in two natures. And these two natures was the nature of God and the nature of man. The Greek word is usia. So in Jesus were two usias, God and man. Now, the word usia and also the Greek word hypostasis meant the same thing in this period of time. So then in Jesus was also two hypostases, which is the same thing as saying two usias. Therefore, when they speak of the hypostatic union, they're speaking of two hypostases being in Christ, one being divine and one being human. Now, Nestorius believed that uh, our, our affirmed Christ in two natures or in two hypostases. But, uh, and, and what he saw was the title of, uh, of Theotokos, robbed Christ of his humanity because the common people would think of Jesus then as being only God, that Mary gave conceived and gave birth to God. Plus, Nestorius felt that calling Mary Theotokos the mother of God would imply to the laity at least that Mary generated God, that God did not exist before the incarnation. So he took issue with the term uh, Theotokos. Now, this caused a great uproar in Constantinople because the monks were used to uh, venerating Mary, praying to Mary, and actually worshiping her as the mother of God. So there was a lawyer there in Constantinople by the name of Eusebius. He was not even, he was not a clergyman. And uh, he took issue with 
uh, Nestorius's position. And he began to write letters and he began to agitate the monks and the clergy around Constantinople concerning this. Now, you, uh, uh, Nestorius's honeymoon in Constantinople didn't last very long because Nestorius was animate about rooting out heresy and the Arians still had a house of worship in Constantinople. And after Nestorius arrived in the capital, their worship house of worship burnt down. Some say Nestorius had it burnt. Some say that the Arians burnt it themselves and blamed it on the new uh, patriarch. We'll probably never know exactly how it got burnt down, but it got tagged on Nestorius and around Constantinople, people who didn't like him began to call him the fire brand. Now, that wasn't meant to be polite. Uh, he was a fire brand of a preacher. And uh, history tells us that the crowds that heard him preach often would erupt in applause and uh, to celebrate the things that, that he was saying. He preached with much, much unction, much like a Pentecostal preacher would in the 21st century. So Nestorius got on the bad side of the population of Constantinople on, at the very first. Everybody loves to hate the man in charge. Americans ought to know that better than anybody else. It doesn't matter who our president is, he's going to be hated on. And the hate's going to be loud. And it's going to be consistent, whether it be a Republican, whether it be a Democrat, or whether it be an independent. Whoever's at the helm, uh, much fault is going to be found with. Well, that's where Nestorius found himself, and much fault was being found with him. But when Cyril, who was the bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, got word that Nestorius had attacked the term Theotokos, then Cyril, who had all the monks of Egypt, uh, and they were a great force, uh, up in arms. So Cyril was happy to enter the list against Nestorius. So there was an exchange of letters back and forth floating around the empire, some accusing Nestorius of having false doctrine concerning the hypostatic union and some defending him. But when Cheryl got, uh, got a hold of the controversy, very quickly he cranked up the heat in accusing Nestorius of preaching to Christ, one of them divine and one of them human. Now that's not what Nestorius taught at all. And we have his letters and his defense even the book that he wrote in his defense called The Bazaar of Heraclides. And we know exactly what Nestorius taught. But the common people didn't have Nestorius's writings. And matter of fact, everything after he was excommunicated, everything that he had written that could be found was destroyed. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So we have sort of a triangle going on here. We have Constantinople in the north. We have Alexandria, Egypt uh, in the south. And then over here to the west a little bit, we have Rome, Italy. And then over here in the east, well, we'll add a fourth one. There is John of Antioch. Now, John of Antioch was a friend of Nestorius. So we can put the Sea of Antioch and the Sea of of Constantinople together as one group. And we can put the Sea of Rome and the Sea of Alexandria, Egypt together in another group. And then there is the player, the one of the most important players, which is the emperor. Well, of course, uh, as it turned out, uh, along about this time, uh, contemporaneous with this time, there were, was a Pelagian outbreak in the West 
under the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome, whose name was Callistine. Now, Pelagius, you will remember, was from the British Isles, and he taught uh, a view of, uh, of anthropology that man was not completely fallen and he did not have a totally deprived nature, in nature, but man could, even in his fallen sinful state, reason himself to God. Now, along about the time of the writing of Augustine uh, that wrote about the total depravity of man, well, this didn't set too well in the Roman Empire. So these, there were four of those Pelagian bishops who were disfellowshipped by Callistine, and they made their way to Constantinople to plead their case before the emperor and also before Nestorius. Well, this incensed the bishop of Rome because cause for him to think that his ruling, that his judgment would be questioned was a great insult. For after all, he was the Pope of, uh, of, of Rome. He did sit in the chair of St. Peter. But these four bishops arrived in Constantinople and pled their case before Nestorius. About the same time that the debate between Nestorius and Cyril heated up. Now let me tell you in just one sentence what that debate was over. Of course, Theotokos was the window dressing, but what the doctrinal point really was, was whether the Christ should be affirmed as from two natures, God and man, or should Christ be affirmed in two natures, God and man. Well, Nestorius said, which was the ancient view of the church and which was the view of the apostles from the apostolic time, that Christ was in two natures. They affirmed Christ in two natures, Christ in the nature of deity and Christ in the nature of humanity. But down in Egypt, Cyril had another idea. For down in Egypt, if you will know, Alexandria uh, was the bed of many uh, heresies and false doctrines. And if you go back to Origen, you go back to Clement of Rome and the subordinationism of, uh, of, of these churchmen, all of that was there brooding in Alexandria. Well, the bishop of, of Alexandria, Cyril, who was of a violent temperament, and history proves that he was not beyond resorting to violence in order to get his way in the church. So Cyril said, no, we do not affirm Christ in two natures, but we affirm Christ from two natures. Now what Cyril's viewpoint was, is this, that yes, Christ had two natures, but they functioned only as one. That the nature of God and the nature of humanity became so blended and had such communication with one another that there was not in actuality two natures, two functioning nature, natures, but there was two natures, but only one functioning nature because the nature of the Lagos, the nature of, of the deity, so consumed the nature of humanity that Christ only operated as uh, God the Son. But up in uh, Constantinople, because he came from Antioch, and Antioch had this tradition, uh, the story said, no, Christ is to be affirmed in two natures. These two natures, though united, are not blended. They are not commingled. They are not mixed together. But Jesus functioned as God and as man on two planes. He functioned as God and man at the same time. Jesus said this, 
believe not that uh, believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. There is the blend. There is the the uniting of these two nation uh, two natures, but yet they are distinct in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John two nineteen, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. The temple there referred to his humanity, but the I that's going to do the resurrecting is referencing the deity nature that was also Christ. So Cyril said, we affirm Christ from two natures. Nestorius said, we affirm Christ in two natures. And here's the battleground. That's the battleground, and that's what the battle was over. Nestorius, when he, and, and let me go back now to the Pelagian bishops that arrived in Constantinople for relief from being excommunicated by Callistine from Rome. And when they appealed to Nestorius, Nestorius sent a letter, his first mistake, he sent a letter to the Roman bishop, Callistine, asking for clarification concerning these Pelagian bishops uh, disfellowshipping because he wanted to ascertain if it was a valid excommunicating or if there was some nefarious things going on. But with that letter, which this is his second mistake, he included his complaint against Cyril and Cyril's attacking him on his Christology. This was in the same letter. When the Pope of Rome, Callistine, got the letter, number one, in the very beginning of the letter, was asking a further clarification concerning these Pelagian bishops that had been disfellowshipped. Well, that insulted the Pope of Rome that the Bishop of Constantinople would question his authority. Because there was, you see, a jealousy of the Roman Pope over Nestorius because he had become the number one preacher of the empire. He had become the, the emperor's bishop. And this was the number one position, don't you know? So there was some animosity there in the very beginning that perhaps that Callistine had been passed over for that position and a monk from Antioch had been brought to that position. So this didn't set well with Callistine that his judgment on the bishops of the Pelagius teaching would be questioned. So he didn't look very favorable either up on Nestorius's complaint of Cyril. So when uh, the Pope of Rome got this letter from Nestorius, he immediately, or close to immediately, he called in a monk of his own. And uh, this monk was uh, John uh, Cassian. Now, John Cassian was a very literate, uh, bilingual uh, individual. And the Pope of, of Rome gave to John uh, Cassian Nestorius' letter and all of his letters that he sent to the Pope. And, and with the instruction that John the monk would write a refutation of Nestorius's position. So John the monk, he wrote seven books against Nestorius. And what the world has known as Nestorianism from that time until today has actually come from John the monk, John Cassasian. And it wasn't what Nestorius taught at all, but it's what this monk from Rome uh, conceived that Nestorius was teaching and believing. 
And uh, a few days ago, I wrote a book that I entitled, uh, I'm sorry, not wrote a book, but I made a video entitled, Sibelius Was Not Sibelian, and also that uh, Nestorius Was Not Nestorian. I had to check my notes to make sure that my name was right there on John Cassian. So what John Cassian wrote became the foundation of Nestorianism. So Nestorianism does not come, the, the heresy of Nestorianism does not come from Nestorius, but it comes from John Cassian of what he supposed Nestorian, Nestorius to have been teaching. So Nestorius wrote uh, a, a few more letters to the Pope of Rome and also during this time was exchanging uh, epistles back and forth with Cyril of Ale Alexandria. Finally, the, 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 the Pope of Rome, Callistine, held a council with his monks and his bishops and disfellowshipped Nestorius from Constantinople. Down in Alexandria, Egypt, Cyril did the same thing. He called the council of his desert monks and of his bishops, and he brought a charge of two Christs, two persons in Jesus against Nestorius, and Nestorius' uh, Christology of affirming Christ in two natures instead of from two natures. And we need to make no mistake about it. This was a war over Christology, a war of whether or not the two natures in Christ uh, remain distinct or if the two natures in Christ were blended into one. And it was basically a war against Nestorius' Christology and Cyril's Christology. Now Nestorius saw Cyril as actually teaching a form of polyarianism that God so incarnated himself into Mary's baby that there was no human being there at all. And uh, so he saw this as a resurrection of an old heresy. And Nestorius was the champion against heresy, don't you know? Now, uh, Antioch had a Christology that was Lagos slash man. But Alexandria, Egypt had a Christology that was Lagos slash flesh. Now, sadly, we see the Alexandrian Christology showing its head in the oneness movement today among the people who will not embrace the full humanity of Christ for they have a God slash flesh Jesus. They don't have a God slash man Jesus as the Bible teaches. So this old heresy of Cyril is still around and raises its head in the Trinitarian camp and also in the oneness camp from time to time. But hey, I don't want to get off in the weeds too far, so we will press forward. But it's important that you remember this. Lagos, which is the word, which is God. Lagos, man, Antioch. Lagos, flesh, Alexandria, Egypt. So Cyril was contending for Lagos, flesh, and Nestorius was contending for Lagos man. For man is much more than the flesh. Man also has a human uh, mind, a human soul, if you would, and a human consciousness, a human spirit, but not so in Cyril's Christology. But in the Christology of Antioch, it did, and that's the Christology that Nestorius was champion, championing. So the letters got heated. 
Shoal and the councils excommunicated Nestorius, but these disfellowshippings were only regional, Rome and Alexander, they were not universal. So when Nestorius saw the handwriting on the wall and he saw what was happening to him, he appealed to his friend, uh, the emperor, and he asked for a, an ecumenical council, uh, a Catholic council, a universal council to be called where this issue would be settled. And Nestorius had every right to believe that the, that the emperor would take his side, and he did, and uh, that this council would exonerate him and set the matters straight. But before the emperor's council could be called, the Pope of Rome and, and, and the Bishop of Alexandria had disfellowshipped uh, their co-religionists. And Callistine of Rome uh, uh, tasked uh, the Bishop of Alexandria, Cyril, with the job of carrying out the order of excommunication. So the Bishop of Rome wrote Cheryl a letter saying uh, what he is doing, that uh, Cheryl uh, was going, or uh, sent Nestorius a letter telling what he was doing. Then he sent Cheryl a letter uh, telling him to excommunicate, uh, call a council, excommunicate uh, Nestorius on his behalf, on the behalf of the Roman Pope. <clears throat> And he was to do it within 10 days after Nestorius had received the ultimatum. Well, Cyril, carrying out the Pope of Rome's bidding, wrote 12 anathemas against Nestorius. Now, Nestorius was pugnacious, just as pugnacious as Cyril, just not as wicked. So when Nestorius received his 12 anathemas, well, he sent back 12 anathemas to Cyril and anathematized him. The emperor had called the council to take place in the city of Ephesus, and the bishop of Ephesus was a man by the name of Memnon that was a supporter of Cyril of Alexandria and Callistine of, of Rome. And uh, the council was to be held in Ephesus and it was to begin, it was uh, called in November of, of, of 430 and it was to convene on uh, Pentecost in 431. And the emperor had uh, charged a man by the name of Count uh, Cadidian, who was the captain of the palace guard, to be the overseer and the administrator of the council. And he sent Cadidian with Nestorius to Ephesus to conduct the council. But And also the emperor had specified how many bishops could be present, how many bishops each one of the patriarchs could bring. But nobody paid him any mind except Nestorius. When Cyril arrived at Ephesus, he brought 50 bishops. Memnon, uh, who was a bishop of Ephesus, had 52 bishops present there with him. And there were 16 bishops uh, that were present with Nestorius that he brought with him from Constantinople. Well, you can see how that Cyril is going to stack this council and stack this court. Mem uh, uh, Memnon and all of his 52 bishops supported Cyril. Of course, Cyril's 50 bishops supported Cyril. Uh, Cyril was the, was the accuser, he was the prosecutor, and he even made himself the chairman of the head of the council. 
Isn't that amazing? Now, the Roman bishop's delegation had not yet arrived. Neither had the Antioch uh, bishop and his delegation arrived, John of Antioch. But it was already past the date that the emperor had called for the council to begin. So Cyril announced, and actually Memnon announced, that he was going to open the council and Cyril was going to be made its president. Well, the emperor's administrator, administrator, Cadidian, challenged it and said, you can't do that. The emperor has given me and me only the authority to call the council to order and to be the administrator of it. Therefore, we've got to wait for the delegation from Rome to get here, and we've got to wait for the delegation from Antioch to get here. Now, the delegation from Antioch were on Nestorius' side. Cyril knew that, and he wanted to call the council to order and get all the dirty work over with before John of Antioch and his bishops and metropolitans arrived. John had further to come than any of them, and he was delayed through a flood that caused him to take a retour around the flood plain. He also was delayed by the death of some of the delegations along the way. So John was a week late arriving. And when John, uh, oh, let me, before I get there, Cyril went ahead and called the council to order. <clears throat> and uh, they presented the case against Nestorius. Cyril was the accuser. Cyril was the prosecutor. <clears throat> and Cyril was the judge. And when Nestorius was asked to come and defend himself against the charges, it's not surprising that he would not come because it was an illegal council. It was a council called uh, out of total disregard to the emperor and to the emperor's administrator. So they went ahead without Nestorius giving a defense, without any of Nestorius's companion bishops being present, and they declared him a heretic, excommunicated him. A week later, a week later, John of Antioch arrives with his delegations of bishops. When he finds out what had happened, that the council had been called by Cyril, uh, the evidence had been, that had been cooked up had been presented, and that Nestorius had given no defense, and that they had disfellowshipped him and excommunicated him anyway, well, John of Antioch was furious. He had made this long artist journey to only be preempted by the anti-Nestorius bishops. So he, along with Cadidian, who is the emperor's administrator of the council, called the true council, called the legitimate council. And they excommunicated Cyril as Polyarians and Arians because they taught that the God of Jesus so consumed the humanity that the humanity did not have any real existence. Polyarianism. So John of Antioch, Nestorius of Constantinople, disfellowshipped Sarah, Memnon, and Memnon. Now, what's to be done? Everybody's excommunicated. So they appeal to the emperor. What are we going to do? Well, in true Byzantine fashion, the emperor validated both councils. Yes, he did. 
We're not told this in history, but Bishop Hayes is telling you. You open your history book and look. The emperor validated both councils and validated the ruling of both councils. So then, not only was Nestorius excommunicated, but Cyril was excommunicated. Memnon was excommunicated. So how did it turn out that we hear of Saint Cyril today and the heretic Nestorius today if they both were excommunicated? Well, I'm going to tell you. Then the emperor had them both arrested, both of them arrested, and put into prison, put into confinement. Now you have this very rich and this very powerful patriarch of Alexandria and this monk from the deserts around Antioch in prison. And they both want to get out. But Cyril had at his disposal the wealth of Egypt. So he began to have his officials in Egypt send presents to the emperor's wife and to the people at court and to the emperor. Really, they were bribes. In order to get his release and permission to return back to his sea in Alexandria. Later on, the archdeacon. Now, those of you that don't know about holy orders and about liturgical Christianity, an archdeacon is not a deacon in the sense of what Protestantism considers a deacon. An archdeacon is next in command to the bishop, and he is either a presbyter or a fellow bishop. So the archdeacon of, of uh, Egypt complained years later that Cyril had impoverished, had, had impoverished, made the Egyptian church so poor through his gifts of bribery that he sent to the emperor and the emperor, emperor's court, including his wife, to buy his way out of prison and to buy his way back to Egypt. Also, also, the bishop of Alexandria controlled the grain shipments from Egypt. And the Roman Empire not only needed, but depended upon the grain from the Nile River Basin. So Cyril had that as his leverage. If you want this grain, then you let me go back to Egypt as the patriarch of Alexandria, although he had been deposed, although he had been excommunicated. But the emperor could override any and all decisions of the clergy. Did you know that in Eastern Orthodox churches to this very day, there is a chair, a throne really, that sits right on the what we would call the platform that no one ever sits in. And I asked one time a, uh, a, a bishop of the Eastern Orthodox what that chair means. He said, that's the emperor's chair that the emperor can come at any time and have a seat there. And the emperor does not even have to receive the Holy Eucharist from the hands of a, of a priest. He can bless and receive the Holy Eucharist himself by himself. So the emperor is the head of the church. It was true at that time. So the emperor Theodotus II could overturn any ruling uh, of the bishops. So he did release Cyril from prison and restore him to his see in Alexandria. Nestorius was also released, but he had resigned his uh, bishopric of Constantinople and he went back to his monastery outside of Antioch. He languished there for a few years probably a broken man, 
because everyone who should have stood with him, even John of Antioch, everyone who should have stood with him in the end, turned away from him. But did you know that Sarah's gifts, and I'm about finished, Sarah's gifts and Sarah's bribes sent to the capital worked in order to get the emperor, who also at one time was Nestorius' friend, to get Nestorius exiled to the oasis in Libya, North Africa, and then later on to a God-forsaken, deserted place in Upper Egypt, where he died in 450 or 451. Look at the diabolicalness of this. Nestorius was not even permitted to live out his life as a monk in Antioch, his old jurisdiction, his old diocese. But Sarah influenced the emperor to take him from there and imprison him in his diocese, in his jurisdiction. So it wasn't enough just to have him excommunicated and branded a heretic, but now he wanted him in his dungeon. He wanted to be his jailer personally. This was an evil act. Now, what's so remarkable to this is that in the end, Nestorius won. Nestorius, the man, was excommunicated and lived out his life as a heretic, as a prisoner. But the year after he died, the council of Chalcedon was convened in 451, that validated Nestorius's Christology of affirming Christ in two natures, not from two natures. Beloved, it is even worded that way. We affirm Christ in two natures. That is Nestorius's teaching, not Sarah's. In fact, in 451, at the Council of Chalcedon, where the hypostatic union was hammered out and the language and what was, was coded so that we today affirm Christ in two natures. The natures not being confused, not being blended, each one functioning independent from the other. That's the Chalcedonian formula, but it's Nestorius's teaching. Sarah lost. Now, and that division was so strong that the Church of Alexandria, Egypt, broke fellowship with the Western Church of Chalcedon and would not affirm the Chalcedonian formula so that today we have the Latin Church from the Roman Catholics we have the uh, Eastern Orthodox that includes all the ethnical Orthodoxes, the Greek Orthodox, the Syrian Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox. And, and then we have the Church of the East, the Assyrian Church, uh, the Assyrian, ancient Syrian Church, the Syrian, Chal the Syrian Chaldean Church, and the Syrian Church. Chaldean church and the Assyrian Chaldean church is what I meant to say and the ancient church of the East. We have them that are Chalcedonians. In other words, they embrace the teaching of Nestorius that we affirm Christ in, can you say it with me? In two natures, Christ in his deity nature and Christ in his man nature. We affirm Christ in two natures. And these two natures remain distinct. 
Then you have what's called the Oriental Orthodox that are the Coptic and uh, is the Jacobite Church of Syria and some other groups. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church. These are Oriental Orthodox that, that were disfellowshipped, excommunicated, if you would, from the Chalcedonian formula of which Nestorius was one of the architects. We used to sing a song back when I was on the evangelistic circuit in the one that's Pentecostal movement. I'd get my guitar and we'd sing, we win, we win, hallelujah, we win. I read the back of the book and we win. We win, we win, hallelujah, we win. Glory, hallelujah, we win. Nestorius, you won, my brother. You won. We are here today, so many centuries later, flying your flag and proud of the accusation of being Nestorians. Now, we're not Nestorians in the sense of John of Cassian because that Nestorianism is all fabricated. It's a straw man doctrine. But we're Nestorian in the sense of what Nestorius really did teach. In closing, let me say I want to recommend to you a book called The Bazaar of Heraclides. The Bazaar of Heraclides is just a fictitious name that has been given to the Apologia of Nestorius. They had to give it a fictitious name in order to conceal it through the centuries to keep it from being destroyed. But it was discovered at the turn of the 19th to the 20th centuries. I think it was in about 1885. It was discovered in Syria, written in Syriac. It has been translated into many languages now. I have an English copy. It's Nestorius' own uh, teaching of what he believed about Christology, about Christ, about Theotokos, about the two natures. His own words. No one can read the Bazaar of Heraclides and accuse, and accuse Nestorius of believing that Christ was two persons, one divine and one human. That's a lie. And when I said to you that in the beginning that when Nestorius went to Constantinople and became the patriarch, all hell broke loose, well, it did. And it's taken all of these centuries to vindicate this great warrior of the faith. But we vindicate him today. And on October the 25th, we celebrate that he existed. And we teach our church the great truth that he did not invent. He just stood up and championed it and said, you all are wrong. Christ doesn't have one nature that is only God. He has two, and he functions on two planes, as God and as human. The Lord bless you, beloved. We do have a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Why? Because he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, God's not tempted. He faced the temptation as a human being. When he prayed in the garden, not my will, but thy will be done. That wasn't God praying to God. That was the human Christ praying from his human nature, praying to the Father, who has existence outside of the incarnation as well 
as inside the incarnation. Oh, amen. Truth of truths. That Jesus, watch this now. This is going to be my closing statement. Jesus was the creator wedded to his creation. God bless you. And the Lord sanctify you in your mind, in your body, and also in your spirit. Until we are together again in another episode, I am Bishop Jerry Hayes. And I bid you Godspeed, my friend. And pray for me when it goes well with you.